Welcome to how to set up and operate the UV5R, a tutorial for newcomers to ham radio, scanning, and transceivers. This is part 13, how to monitor for distress calls and emergencies. I served as a volunteer firefighter, hazmat technician, and emergency medical technician for 26 years, 10 of those years in a community of about 11,000. I'm retired now, but I'm pursuing involvement with ARES, A-R-E-S, Amateur Radio Emergency Services. ARES is a nationwide organization that helps connect ham radio operators with police, fire, medical, search and rescue, and other emergency responders in a county or region. I like the idea of having my UV-5R with me while traveling, hiking, or camping. In an emergency, it could prove helpful, even life-saving. Simply carried in my pack, switched off to conserve battery power, it would be easy to grab in an emergency and call for assistance. There is an additional way in which I could use my UV-5R to help others. I don't think I could have it on all day long in the wild, but there is a way to find a compromise between listening for emergency traffic and conserving battery charge. It's known as the Wilderness Protocol. Quote, the Wilderness Protocol is a dedicated effort to ensure emergency communications in areas beyond normal repeater, repeater coverage, or in the event local repeaters are off the air and not reachable in an emergency situation. That from harriscountyaries.org. The core idea in the Wilderness Protocol is to monitor the frequencies and repeater stations that would commonly be used to call for help in an emergency. The radio would be kept switched off normally, but switched on at regular intervals throughout the day or night to briefly listen for any distress calls or emergency traffic. There are at least 10 national calling frequencies for the amateur radio operator. Only two of these may be programmed into the UV-5R. Of these national calling frequencies, the two that can be programmed into the Beofeng UV-5R would be 146.520 MHz, that's for VHF calling frequency, and 446.000 MHz for the UHF calling frequency. As a minimum, I would recommend monitoring these two frequencies plus any local repeater frequencies. The Wilderness Protocol suggests several different monitoring schedules which could be followed. Every three hours on the hour for five minutes, that would be the least drain on the battery. Every three hours on the hour for 10 minutes, five minutes before the hour, five minutes after the hour. Every hour on the hour for five minutes. Or finally, continuous monitoring. That would be the greatest drain on the battery. Here's the basic five minute procedure. Listen to the frequencies for four minutes. Call for traffic, listen for 30 seconds. Call once more for traffic, listen again for 30 seconds. Then turn the radio off until the next monitoring interval. Remember, these are calling frequencies. After contact is established, you would agree to move to a different frequency, usually 15 or 20 kilohertz off the calling frequency. The website at k0nr.com suggests three principles to consider. Principle number one, don't ever rely on a radio or mobile phone to get you out of trouble in the wilderness. Your primary strategy must be self-sufficiency. Avoid trouble. Be prepared for the unexpected. Principle two, know what repeaters are available in your area. You need to know the frequency, offset, and CTCSS tone, if any. Principle three, in remote areas, monitor 146.520 megahertz as much as possible. 
This would apply to backcountry travelers, mobile stations, and fixed stations. The UV5R is limited to amateur radio frequencies in the 2 meter and 70 meter bands. One option to consider would be carrying a scanning receiver in addition to the UV5R. Good quality scanning receivers may be purchased at a lower cost than transceivers. I have a Pro82 scanner made by Radio Shack with a 200 channel storage capability. It has the ability to receive a much wider range of radio bands, plus the Pro82 scans through frequencies much faster than the UV5R. Typically, a scanning receiver is less expensive than the same quality transceiver. A scanning receiver is designed specifically to listen only, cycling through hundreds of frequencies very rapidly, stopping only when there is traffic detected. I could use both radios with the Wilderness Protocol, scanning a wide range of bands with the receiver. If I detect a distress call, I could use the UV5R to attempt contact either with the one calling for help or another ham operator and relay the message. Relaying would not be as good as having direct contact with the station in distress, but it would certainly be a way to help. As I've considered how to use my UV5R in the event of an emergency, the website of my local chapter of Ares included a link to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Office of Emergency Communications, which led to an interesting free downloadable version of the National Interoperability Field Operations Guide, NIFOG. I think this guide can provide some essential nationwide commonly used frequencies in the event of an emergency or distress call. The NIFOG is a good resource, but even better are frequency plans that are developed and published by an Aries chapter in your own local region. That said, here are some VHF and UHF frequencies that I've gleaned from NIFOG and other sources which could be monitored for distress calls and emergencies. Remember, using the UV5R to transmit on frequencies for which we are not licensed is illegal unless, quote, the communications involved relate directly to the imminent safety of life or property. Transmit on these frequencies only during cases of emergency. Quote, when necessary for the immediate protection of life or property, FCCC Part 90 licensees may use prudent measures beyond the specifics of their license. See FCC Rule 90.407, Emergency Communications. That from IdahoAries.info. Calling channels seems to me to be the primary frequencies which I should monitor. Someone in distress, which could be me, will likely first try a local repeater, but if there's no immediate response, they most likely would try transmitting on a nationwide or commonly used frequency, which fits the definition of calling frequency. Of course, as I've spent more and more time listening to more and more local 2 meter and 70 meter hams, I'm starting to recognize the most commonly used frequencies for my own particular area. These likely will be my A-list of channels, unless I'm traveling. Now, here are some nationwide commonly used calling frequencies. The following frequencies are not official nationwide interoperability frequencies, but they are commonly used. If a repeater station is available, the commonly used CTCSS tone for the following is 156.7 Hz, but tones may vary locally for these frequencies. It's always good to be able to receive weather reports. Amateur radio operators are not allowed to transmit on the National Weather Service frequencies, but we certainly may listen to them. I have in the past used inexpensive two-way radios that use 
the Family Radio Service. Quote, the Family Radio Service, FRS, is a private, two-way, short-distance voice and data communication service for facilitating family and group activities. The most common use for FRS channels is short-distance, two-way voice communications using small, handheld radios that are similar to walkie-talkies. That from FCC.gov. No license is required to use FRS radios. However, the UV5R is not FCC certified to transmit on FRS frequencies. The FRS radios must be limited in power and range. So use the UV5R to transmit on FRS frequencies only in emergencies. The General Mobile Radio Service, GMRS, is, quote, a licensed radio service that uses channels around 462 MHz and 467 megahertz. The most common use of GMRS channels is for short distance, two-way voice communications using handheld radios, mobile radios, and repeater systems. In 2017, the FCC expanded GMRS to also allow short data messaging applications, including text messaging and GPS location information. That again from FCC.gov. The FCC does require licensing in order to transmit on GMRS frequencies. Using the UV5R to transmit on GMRS should only be in cases of emergency. Note the GMRS frequency of 462.67 MHz. That's the nationwide traveler's assistance frequency. And there is also a GMRS frequency that's shared with FRS, 462.7125. Multi-use radio system, MERS, M-U-R-S. Quote, MERS is an American VHF radio band, not to be confused with FRS or GMRS. MERS essentially fills the gap between the UHF frequencies provided by FRS and GMRS and the lower frequencies used by CB radios. That from bugoutbagbuilder.com. MERS does not require an FCC license, but it does require specifically designed radios. The UV5R is not certified by the FCC to operate on MERS frequencies, even though the UV5R is capable of receiving and transmitting on those frequencies. A quick search of the FCC website shows at least one design issue that immediately makes it potentially illegal to transmit on MERS with the UV5R. Quote, no MERS transmitter shall under any condition of modulation transmit more than 2 watts transmitter power output. That from FCC.gov. Using the UV5R to transmit on FRS, GMRS, and MURS frequencies may be potentially illegal, depending upon the situation and the circumstance, regardless of your FCC license. So, again, transmit on these frequencies only in case of emergencies. I can see good reason for at least having a list of FRS and GMRS and MURS emergency frequencies. They could be part of my wilderness protocol and used in case of emergency only. Here's a handy list of three-digit telephone numbers that may be helpful for many non-emergency situations, as well as one emergency number. Note, an additional three-digit code will be added, 988. Suicide Prevention Hotline. The addition was agreed upon in August 2020. Currently, there are 83 instances in the United States where 988 is used as a prefix code. Implementation of that number for the Suicide Prevention Hotline will require time to resolve those numbering conflicts. It looks like implementation is planned for July 2022. Text Messaging there may be a need to send an email a message to a phone that can only accept text messages. 
Here's a list of a few carriers that provide an email to SMS or MMS service. I started with a long list obtained from NIFOG, but could verify only a few. So if you need to send a message to a phone service that's not on this following list, you'll need to get the address elsewhere, ideally from the holder of the phone. SMS, by the way, stands for Short Message Service, text only, no pictures or video. MMS stands for Multimedia Messaging Service, which allows videos, pictures, audio clips, and more. Number in the following chart is the 10-digit or 11-digit mobile telephone number for the person you're sending the email to. How does a ham operator effectively call for help? Here's a distress calling procedure. 1. Tune to 146.520 MHz or the most used frequency in your area. 2. If you hear an operator transmitting on that frequency, break in and attempt to contact them. 3. If they hear and acknowledge you, calmly give your situation, then wait at your location. Don't wander off. That turns a rescue into a search and rescue. Stay put. 4. If it seems no one has heard you or you can't hit the repeater, try broadcasting in the blind, just repeatedly calling out for help following the rest of this procedure. Try transmitting on the downlink frequency of the repeater. 5. If you don't think you're being heard and you haven't made contact, say slowly and clearly the words, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Repeat it three times. 6. Say, this is, and give your call sign three times, and then your name once. 7. State over the air your position as, as, as exact as possible. 8. Give the nature of the emergency, medical, fire, criminal, persons lost, crash or disaster, whatever's happening. 9. Indicate the type of assistance needed, police, ambulance, search and rescue, extrication, whatever is needed. And 10. End your transmission by saying over and then stay on frequency and listen. For example, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is WD49YL. 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 My name is Mark Wells. I'm located on Highway 45 near Johnson Road. I've just been in an accident and I'm trapped in my car. Please call 911 and send the fire department over. If someone responds, great. If not, there's still a decent chance someone listening could be calling 911. They just can't make contact back with you. Perhaps they're listening on a scanner. If you hear no response, repeat that procedure over and over for two minutes and then listen for three. If still no answer, switch off the radio to conserve battery charge and then wait until the top of the hour and begin calling again. It's a good idea if you indicate in your transmission that you'll be off the air until the top of the next hour so other stations will know when to listen for you. How does an operator relay a distress message? Here's an example. Mayday relay. Mayday relay. Mayday relay. This is W. D49YL, WD49YL, WD49YL. My name is Mark Wells. I am receiving a mayday from Joe Smith. They are located on Highway 45 near Johnson Road. They've been in an accident and are trapped in a car. Please call 911 and send the fire department. Over. And finally, consider traveling with a citizen's band radio. 
in the event of an emergency or distress call. Conclusion Out of the box, with minimal practice, the Baofeng UV-5R can be used to listen for distress calls and emergencies. With practice and an FCC license to transmit, the UV-5R becomes essential for operators who desire to support and protect their community and fellow travelers. One big question though, does my technician class license allow me to transmit on FRS, GMRS, or MURS frequencies? The short answer is no, not legally, unless the situation is a life-threatening emergency. However, there may be good reasons to have these bands programmed into your radio. I desire the capability to hear distress calls, whatever the band, and in an emergency, I desire the capability to respond to such emergency transmissions. Josh at Ham Radio Crash Course provides a good overview of the question, especially concerning the Baofeng UV5R transceiver. Thank you. This has been How to Set Up and Operate the Baofeng UV5R Transceiver, a tutorial for newcomers to ham radio scanning and transceivers. All of the episodes of this video tutorial series may be found on my YouTube channel. I'm Milt Reynolds, KJ7PPX, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. 73.